Okay, so people come to systems and they say, whoa, whoa, this is, this is too difficult. Help me, help me to understand something about systems. Well, I have found a framework from somebody called Dave Snowden, uh, which is spelt C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. -E it's a Welsh word. I think it's pronounced Canavin, but let's go with that for the time being. And it's, it's a very helpful framework, and do go and look at Dave Snowden's website. You'll find it there. Um, good piece of work. So I, I am grateful to him for this. And what it says is that, yes, there are lots and lots of different kinds of systems, but they broadly fit into four categories. This is going to sound quite reductionist and mechanistic, but it is useful. But we have to be aware that there are big overlaps between these. But broadly, these four categories are that systems are either simple, complicated, complex, or chaotic. And it is possible to look at a system that you're reviewing and roughly sit it into that framework and then that can help you to think about what are some of the issues in relation to that system and how you then might deal with it. So I'm going to go quite quickly over this because there's a whole world of literature inside each of these. There's a very good book by somebody called Michael Jackson, believe it or not, no relation to the beat it, Michael Jackson, but he's a professor of systems at Hull University and has written a book about systems and systems thinking for managers. And it goes through all the different systems methodologies, giving a chapter, I think a 10 or 11 chapters, giving a chapter to each one. So if you want a nice, easily accessible way of understanding different systems methodologies, and he uses a very useful, another framework for positioning these, then Jackson's book is useful. Before I go into the simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, what I would like to do is, on the grid for this, so we've got simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, there's a line this way, if you like, where Schumacher is helpful to us as well. Because on this side, where we have simple and complicated, Schumacher would say we can use convergent thinking. Whereas on this side, where we have complex and chaotic, we use divergent thinking. So simple means we've got a machine is a simple system. And some ways of doing things in organizations are simple systems. Not many, but some. So like processing insurance claims or, you know, I don't know, but some simple pass it on, ticket, pass it on, those kind of mechanistic. But there are not many of them in organizations and there are far less of them than people like to think. So, but a, a machine is essentially a simple system. So um, most bits of machinery you can think of are they might have complicated features, but they're essentially quite simple in the way that they work. A bicycle is a simple system. We can understand it. It's a machine. And if we're looking at simple systems, we can use things like flowchart, process analysis, what used to be called total quality management. These days it goes by a number of other names, but that kind of process improvement approach. And I used to, be, I used to earn my living from that doing process improvement, and I thought I was a systems thinker at the time. Um, but I realize now that what I was doing, and this is useful, the analogy I'm about to draw is useful, because essentially, if you look at an organization, and that's where I did most of my work, it's like a plate of spaghetti. Lots of intertwined pieces of spaghetti. And what process improvement often does is say, let's get hold of one of these and pull it out of the plate and hold it up and improve it. And so you get this one process. It might be some part of manufacturing, might be a, uh, you know, one of your support processes. And they think, great, we've got this really working well now. We understand what it is, who its customers are, and so on. Let's put it to work in the system. And we look down at the plate, and we see the spaghetti. And we think, oh, how do we get this system back into the plate of spaghetti? And I realize now that actually 
what I was doing in that work was very often oversimplifying something that was actually quite complicated or complex. And when it came to putting that in now improved process back into its interrelationship with the rest of the organization, it no longer functioned in the way that we thought it was going to. So that's why I say there are not that many processes that really are simple. When we come on to complicated, complicated is simple with layers of extra simplicity laid onto it. So a jet engine is complicated. So it's got lots of parts that have to all work together, but essentially it does what you expect it to do. And unless something goes wrong, it carries on doing what you expect it to do, what it's been designed to do. It has predictable outcomes. It doesn't have unexpected emergent properties. It has an emergent property, it produces thrust. But that's what you expect it to do, that's what you've designed it to do. So although it's very complicated, it does do what you want it to do until such time as it breaks. I'm going to, before I come on to the tools you might use in this area, I'm going to contrast that with complex. Complex is, and very often this is where you chuck human beings into the mix, uh, is where you get unexpected emergent properties, you get unpredictability. Things happen that you didn't design for, or you thought you designed for one thing and you get another. And this is very often true of social and human systems. And many, many systems that we look at lie in this area of complex. Now what uh, Schumacher very strongly argued is that a lot of the world is divergent in nature. It has many possible outcomes. There, are no, there is no simple answer. But what we tend to do, and we do this a lot in organisations, we try and pull this divergent issue, I had it over here, didn't I? We try and pull it into the convergent. We try to simplify it in order to solve it. And very often we do that by analysis. So we think, if we just analyse this enough, we'll understand it, and when we understand it, we'll be able to come to a solution and Schumacher argues this is, this is a mistake of the intellect, that we can't do that. If something's divergent, it's divergent. We should deal with it as divergent. We should deal with it in its complexity, not try to make it complicated or simple in order to solve it. And I think this is a big lesson for many organisations and many ways that we try to solve things, that we try to drag them into the complicated. We try to make them convergent. And interestingly, if you read Jackson's book, I think it actually quite neatly splits into systems methodologies where people believe the world is essentially understandable and with enough analysis, a solution can be found. And on the other end, people who think the world is actually too complex ever to be fully understood, so let's not bother to, to even try to understand it or, or recognise that our understanding is only partial. And actually, these two meet in the middle. But when they get under pressure, they seem to fly back to their, where they're more comfortable. And no disrespect, but engineers go that way and social scientists go that way. So, uh, but I, I know that'll be contentious. I'm generalizing horribly. When you look at the tools that are available, they do tend to reflect that a bit. So in the complicated space, the, one of the major area of tool is systems dynamics, which is Donella Men uh, Meadows, Peter Senge, uh, you know, fifth discipline. So some people would argue that that helps you with complicated, and, but you have to be very wary of it when you get into complex when you start to get unexpected emergent properties, it possibly doesn't serve you quite so well. Nonetheless, system dynamics is a very useful method for trying to better understand a system. And that has things in it like, well, behavior over time. That's one of the big starting points with systems dynamics. Let's, let's get some, some information that tells us how this system is working over time. Are there feedback loops? Are there any 
positive feedback loops where things are reinforcing or are there negative feedback loops where things balance themselves out over time? Um, are there stocks? Are there flows? How do they work together? What flows? We tend to look a lot at, all, at systems in the way that they flow and we forget. You know, we're a rich country because we have stocks. We have stocks of roads, of power lines, telephone systems. We've got big stocks that other countries haven't got and would find it incredibly difficult to get. But we tend to look most of the time at flows. What's the money going around in it? Where's the food moving? What's the transport? These are flows, whereas we ignore the stocks. And the stocks are often the big thing that gives the system its strength and its structure, makes it what it is. So these are the kind of things that systems dynamics helps us with. And Meadows sets out also a lot of traps that we fall into around systems thinking and ways that systems work, like success to the successful. Or you know, I won't go into them all now, but there's quite a list of things that are typical of the way that systems function. So systems dynamics are a really good place to start with understanding a systems methodology. It, this is in my, in, in my view. And another model that sits in there, which is very, very useful for organisations and quite a wide variety of organisations, is something called the viable system model, which looks at typically the way an organisation links its kind of policy and strategy making areas to its delivery and how the information flows and so on. So viable system model is a very good, very useful framework for understanding organisations. But for the most part, I think those two sit in the complicated area. They sit in the convergent thinking. They do begin to, to deal with divergence and complexity, but mostly they deal with convergence and complicatedness, if that's a word. So when you come over into the complex and you're dealing with the unpredictable, you're often dealing with human beings, you're dealing with unexpected emergence, how then? Well, then you've got a choice to make, in my view, and your choice is between deciding whether you think this can be analysed and understood or if some analysis is going to be helpful. So let's do some analysis and see what happens. Let's see if we can get data. Let's see if we can understand the system that's working and then see if that takes us towards solutions. But doing that in a systems thinking way, so we know we're doing this carefully, we're doing it with an open mind, we're not expecting it to deliver full results. That's one choice. The other choice is to say, this is too complex, it's really not worth trying to understand it in that way, let's go in the other direction. Let's just go from where we are now, forwards, rather than trying to diagnose and analyse looking backwards. We have a love of looking backwards. We have a love of organising things as a species, I think. You know, we love clear-cut, mechanistic, listy solutions. We love numbers, formulae, mathematics, all these things. But essentially, they look that way. And we might say, well, actually, perhaps we're better served by experimenting forwards. And, and the approach that we would use for this is called action research or action experiment, as I prefer to call it. And I'm going to come back to that because I'm, I'm, there's a whole talk on action experiment, which I'll, we'll follow this one. So just to mention the sorts of tools that might serve you if you go into an essentially analytical, let's try and understand this approach, the main one would be what's called soft systems methodology, which was developed by somebody called Checkland, who originally was at ICI. And his great contribution to this is something called a rich picture, which is, which is what it says it is. It's a lovely idea, a simple phrase. But he says, let's create a rich picture of this system. Let's see if we can get to understand it by whatever way seems helpful. So we might paint it, we might draw it, we might sing it, we might analyse it, we might flow chart it, we might do all these things and we put them all up on the wall and we get a say, yeah, I think we're getting some idea now of what's going, going on here. And he would then use that to try to say, if that's how it is, how would we like it to be 
And what's the difference between the two? And how do we close the gap? But he would ask lots of questions along the way, which were things like, is it worth doing it? Do we understand this well enough to know that if we try to improve it, it will be improved? Or might we make it worse? Is non-intervention actually as good a thing to do as intervening? So he'd make you ask those kind of social and other questions around the system to stop you just jumping in and saying, yeah, we've got it, we know the solution, let's implement it. Because sometimes a system is organising itself as well as it can, warts and all, might be just best, let it be. So soft systems methodology is a very helpful, and I think that it, uh, it makes more allowance for the unpredictable, the emergent, than does systems dynamics. But it is still essentially an analytical technique. So as I say, I'm going to talk separately about what action experiment is, because I would strongly hold that that is the most useful tool to use in this area, and consequently a very useful tool to use on many, many occasions, because so often systems are complex. And when we come to chaotic, uh, all a bit more difficult, really, because what we're talking about is turbulent conditions where there are no right answers or there are many, many possible answers, none of which you could say is the correct one. Um, and how do you go forward in here? And I'm, I'm going to suggest a version of action experiment, which is often collaborative, so what's called collaborative inquiry, or what David Bohm would call dialogue, but that means very deep dialogue, not having a chat. It means over a long period of time, we as a group, if we were trying to deal with the problem, we'd really talk and talk and talk to get past our own individual worldviews and ego states to try and get a sense of the collective between us. So that's, that's a possible tool that we could use, dialogue or deep conversation. Um, open space technology as a way of doing meetings, that's a way of giving the agenda to people so that if you've got lots of people coming with, lot, with different views of a system, you can organise around them. That might be one way. In the end, I think when we're in chaotic, we find ourselves asking deep questions about ourselves and our relationship to the world. So even, I might even say it's not a tool, but an attitude of mind that comes in dealing with the chaotic is something to do with spirituality and some, what's my connection to that which I don't understand, which some people might call mysterious, might call it God, whatever you want, but, you know, to that which I think is kind of beyond the human, which is at the moment inexplicable. Where am I in relation to that? And that can often be where chaotic sits. Dave Snowden is very useful. These four areas can take a system, does it, which one of these does it fit into? Is it essentially convergent, solvable, or divergent? We've got to think of different ways of dealing with it. And does it fit into simple, complicated, complex, or chaotic? It's not going to be perfect, but I think it gives you a steer, and then it can point you towards what methodology might be useful but all this needs to be done with you, with your systems thinking way of being. If you're coming at it mechanistically, you'll go for the analytical routes. You'll try and get linear results. If you come at it systems thinking, you'll be open to possibilities. You'll try things out. If they don't serve you, you'll let them go. Do you see the, why I'm making the distinction between the two?